Hey there, folks. Rel here. Welcome back to another episode of the Untitled TTRPG Podcast. I have uh, with me John, per usual. And John, I would like to ask you a question. If a Minotaur has a plus five strength and a Gnome has a plus five strength, can they both grapple large beasts the same? Can they both lift as heavily as one another? Lifting, yes. Grappling, no. What about wielding heavy weapons? In 2014, the answer would have been no because it has to do with size category. In 2024, it's just based off of your strength score, which okay. is 13. Listen, I'm not going to be ad adept at 2024, but <laughs> the point being, the uh, yeah, I've decided not to <laughs> not to get those books for now unless somebody really twists my arm. But the point being is, uh, do you envision the a plus five strength score as being the same? across multiple people are they both just wicked burly i mean when you look at 2014 uh guidelines for a plus five strength herculean right are you comparing it against people of the same kin and kind or are you comparing it uh, across all divisions like if somebody is an ogre with a plus five strength does that look different than somebody or like even a dragon with a plus five strength what does that look like compared to a person you know just a normal joe to me and this is the point of the, the conversation, we're going to get into it, is really what do, what story do ability scores tell? We can focus on the mechanics of them, and I think that a lot of games do that. And at the same time, I, I feel like uh, we're reviewing them in like a really like mechanical focused, very archaic way that's been grandfathered in by just the tradition of Dungeons and Dragons. But it becomes very difficult to tell a story unless you can ground the, the attributes, ability scores in, in something meaningful. Now, there's, there's my take uh, right out the gate, John. Let me know what you think. Well, I don't think your take is out of left field. Um, I think it's something that's generally agreed upon by at least a significant fraction of the TTRPG community. Um, I feel personally my take is a lot less popular, which is, and I've felt this for a long time, which is I'm okay with abstract game mechanics being abstract game mechanics that also facilitate a story where like hit points don't need to have a single grounded definition of this is like a character's health or vitality. Like Jeremy Crawford brought up in an interview years ago that hit points could simply represent a character's general luck. So when they take 20 damage, they're not literally taking a sword that could kill five peasants. They're 20 points luckier or 20 points more skilled at not getting hit by a fatal blow. Um, and hit points, even the name of it, is this kind of abstract thing. It's not like it's a character's health or a character's luck where it's like grounded by a story thing. So I've always looked at the modifiers very similarly, where like a gnome with a plus five strength doesn't have the same muscle mass as a minotaur with plus five strength. What it means is when they generally try to accomplish strength-based tasks, they have a 25% greater likelihood of accomplishing the task that they're setting out to do. The mm -hmm. methodology doesn't really matter as much. Um, and again, I don't think that's like a popular interpretation. Uh, I don't know. I, I think that a lot of I think that a lot of folks would agree with that. At the same time, it seems to me like sort of a so it's it's fine. Like I said, easy to understand. Number goes up. I think if you swing it to extremes, it gets kind of the point across. So when you look at critical role, for example, um, the uh, the the big Goliath uh, Grog is. He's, he's just a stereotypical, super strong, super dumb character. Uh, and you got others that kind of fall in, in similar veins, like Vax and Vex are both very dexterous. Uh, Percy Dorolo is probably high intelligence and probably okay charisma. If I had to guess, I don't know the, the character, uh, the stats. But And if you, if you do push those extremes, you can kind of create enough contrast that it does tell a story. However when everybody is kind of like sitting on like, okay, well, it's a little plus two and a little minus one, whatever. It's very difficult to discern the meaning of that outside of something mechanical. 
I, I view it as a missed opportunity to take a feature of your game and align it toward something that the game cares strongly about. So uh, let's look at, for example, if I, I'll, I'll just touch on this real quick and then we'll come back. But in the one ring, uh, there are three core attributes. You have your strength, you have heart, and you have wits, which are a really good way to kind of boil things down into, into your you know, s strength and just the like resilience and just how, how clever you can be, which are all facets of the, the Lord of the Rings story. When you watch, uh, you know, just watch Lord of the Rings and it, it all becomes very obvious just by virtue of the names of those attributes, by virtue of the uh, how many you have, it tells you that, hey, we don't care really strongly about how, like, you know, how dexterous are you, you know? Because um, that can kind of be explained away. And even strength, the skills that are listed under it are things like awe or song. So it's it's not even strength in the traditional sense of pure physicality. It is the ability to exude this sort of like um, this this power, this prowess, this uh, something captivating uh, about the character. To me, that's that's an example of a game that very tightly uses their mechanic to to set the tone for the world. And when I think about something like Dungeons and Dragons, the mechanic doesn't do that. Yeah, um, you actually said something that crystallized this lingering feeling I've been having about D and D in particular. Um, which is, it's a missed opportunity. Um, so specifically to come back to uh, Grog, who is the barbarian from Critical Role, um, right. he's actually a good example of the whole no minotaur thing you brought up, which is uh, Jeremy Crawford, while interviewing about the new barbarian design, just casually dropped that rage as this supernatural magical effect. So when you're looking at, you know, why is this gnome up? as strong as a minotaur, like the throwaway explanation just tends to be it's magical. Like it's magical. It's supernatural. Don't think about it. Move on. And that's where I, I think you've got a really strong point in that it is a missed opportunity. You know, even assuming that strength is the raw power that a creature has, why are they so powerful? Are they so powerful? Is it a mundane thing where they just worked out a lot like Batman or is there some kind of magical, quote unquote, magical fuel, like say Superman, like Superman's strength is very different than Batman's strength. And how can we convey that with different monster types to demonstrate how the world works? And again, like you said, D&D &D has this weird legacy of tiered play where it's like Minotaurs are CR three. So level three characters need to be able to defeat them. Some people like that, some people don't. But again, it's like a mechanical decision that doesn't always make sense in certain parts of the game story, but it does make sense in other ways. So I think it. the first thing is to identify what kind of game you want to tell. And I know Distal is grounded, not gritty, um, but your approach to it is going to be different than, you know, for lack of a better term, the kind of super heroic fantasy that 5e offers. One of the reasons that I thought this conversation might be helpful to both of us is that we're both creating games, and I've been thinking a lot about attributes, ability scores lately. I've gone through a number of uh, iterations on how you acquire them. Like currently in the in the beta, every level you can increase a an attribute by one, but you can't increase the same attribute again until you reach a new milestone. So milestones are every four levels, and then it kind of clears those plateaus, and. Uh, the the point is to throttle characters' acceleration, but do it in a way that like almost forces them to, or it definitely does force them to distribute their uh, their gains. But when I was looking at it, it it was just strictly mechanical. And when I think about something like, so if you're looking at dexterity, what does that mean? Like, where does your dexterity come from? Like, how do, how does it manifest on the character? I wonder if that would be a better way to tie the the idea of a core attribute together with uh, what it's actually doing to your character. Or are you uh, strong because you're just burly, totally ripped? Or are you more athletic? Or maybe you're just just bold 
you know, you're, you're uh, confident even, or maybe regimented, just like super practiced in what you do. All of those things could, could technically be strength. I mean, they could be a lot of things, but giving yourself kind of uh, traits to help describe the character might be an easier way to kind of bridge that gap between strictly mechanics and character concept. Yeah, I think another way, so this is something I'm tinkering with with my own system, but making sure each ability score actually matters. Like, so you you brought up the example of Grog, who's big, burly, dumb guy. And why is that such a popular archetype in D&D stories? Well, it's because intelligence doesn't really matter. Like, the only things it comes up for are checks that end up kind of being inconsequential and then the uh, intelligence saves, which are extremely rare. Um, and there are other ways to help navigate against those. Like usually intelligence save abilities are like psychic damage. So you can just get resistance to psychic damage. The way that in my little prototype game, um, I'm handling saving throws is that there you don't get proficient in saving throws. They're a sum of two ability scores. So fortitude is not just constitution based. It's it's uh, strength and constitution based. So if you're a wizard, there's a reason still to pick strength. It's It can be a dump stat, but it also means that if it's a minus one, you're taking away from your fortitude. Um, reflex is awareness, which is my version of wisdom, and dexterity. So like the idea is you could either perceive the thing coming really fast and there's a factor of how quickly can you get out of the way. So that way when you're thinking about dump stats there, it, it's a much harder decision than just being like, I never use charisma. So charisma is my minus one on this character. Um, and I think a lot of times when you give everything a functional use as well as a plausible origin or a plausible way that it's coming about, then it just changes how players approach their character and approach character builds. And it actually opens up more options. So one thing I don't like about D&D is how you'll have like a ranger and there it's not a question of if you're going to bump up your dex. Dex is the thing you need to max out for that character to mechanically function properly. Um, and I just think that, I don't know, that kind of narrow tracked design <laughs> is something that is making me less and less interested as I go along my TTRPG playing. So that point in, in particular is kind of, it's interesting to me because I, I think the whole industry has kind of moved on from um, from using, I shouldn't say the whole industry, that's a very sweeping statement, um, has moved on from uh, ability scores that then get translated into bonuses to just like simmer it down to the bonuses. But the reason that the scores existed is because they had mechanical differences. So you need a 13 strength, which is... 13 is a very specific number that doesn't specifically give you a, a bump because you've already gotten that at 12 to wear heavier armor. Uh, or if you if you want to multi-class into, you know, say like a paladin or, or something else, like you need some odd number of strength and charisma in order to achieve that. And I think that modern D&D players in particular have said like, no, we don't want limitations on on uh you know our class progression we just want to be creative and just do what we want to do and the game is kind of our sandbox we're not actually beholden to things that go on in that world we just want to live this super heroic fantasy and that's that's how things have shifted over time even um so i i think i'd be remiss if i didn't mention that the the uh barbarian archetype is is way before dungeons and dragons and i don't think that it actually has anything to do with an um, ability scores i think that it has to do with how we uh visualized uh, mistakenly so like neanderthals we we view them as like really powerful but also really dumb which is totally not the case and uh but this is kind of like an ingrained view that we've just carried with us throughout however many years of uh, of, of history and uh, it was perpetuated when it comes to just like cowboys and indians like yeah, no, the, the savages were, yeah, you know, they're just, they act mechanically in a certain way, but oh, they can't be too smart. And that's like, that's because we're racist. <laughs> you know, I get like, there's, there's definitely a lot of those ingrained 
uh, uh, like bioessentialism sort of uh, mentalities that kind of trickled through uh, into to modern day, and we just carry them in a way that is less uh, less offensive, or they they've evolved into something else, being like like the barbarians, you know, strong but dumb. Uh, anyway tangential but uh talking about uh ability scores versus um bonuses so back then when we cared about scores which i wish was 2014 we, st- we stopped doing it because of just the, how the audience developed over time uh we we decided to to care less about what the game was telling us to do and more about what we wanted to do with the game just to comment on the ability score thing there are functions of it in 2014 and it's their little functions like they it seems like a bad excuse to keep them in (laughs) so like you said the prerequisites is a big thing like even with my system which i take away the ability scores i just worry about the modifiers like wearing heavy armor the prerequisite does it need to be a 13 or can you just say plus one like it i don't think it needs to be that granular because the added granularity doesn't add more meaningful decision making in my eyes at least um another thing that like the score is used for that almost nobody uses is encumbrance um which is something i'm very interested in i don't think players should be able to skyrim it and carry 27 enchanted swords on their person at all times i don't think that's particularly interesting myself but you you mentioned meaningful decision making yes i think you're correct uh in that it doesn't necessarily create different decisions but i think that it gives you that little bit of progression feel like you can work towards something, uh, which you can't do if you are operating on strictly modifiers. Uh, I shouldn't say you can't do that. Um, I should say that you have less wiggle room with how often you can do that and the types of things that you can do. I, I wonder how much value uh, attribute scores even have in, in D&D anymore. Yeah, this is, this is the balance, the two extremes, which is how granular do you want to get and how excited are your players are about that granularity? And I'm going to go out on a limb and say like 5e D&D, no matter which version you're playing, um, kind of sits in the middle. <laughs> uh, so in that system, I don't think that the ability scores, like the, the double digit scores matter as much as the modifiers. Um, something like Pathfinder is much more granular. Um, granular to the point that my table rejected it. Um, there was just way too much to keep track on. It wasn't exciting for my players. Um, but there are definitely other people I've met where that is their jam. They love having as many different little settings and, uh, levers and buttons to tinker with in order to fine tune their character to be exactly what they want to be. And I've met other people that say even 5e is too many rules, um, where they want more of a rules light system, which I think would speak more to a lack of modifiers. I mean, Savage Worlds is a system I have limited experience with. And if you play Savage Worlds, feel free to correct me in the comments. Um, but the skills aren't modifiers that you're adding to as much as it is the size of your die. So you start with a D4 for a certain skill. And then as you get stronger at it, you can upgrade it to a D6 or a D8 and so on and so on. So it's like, it's a different way to show that progression, but without the math side of it, it's just a different rock that you pick up with different amounts of sides. So yeah, there's, there's totally, there's so many different ways to, to handle this sort of exploration of what a character can do. And ability scores don't necessarily need to be the thing. It's that the sort of dice pool system is another way to handle it and tells a lot more about a character than the than the abstract, I feel like, of strength, dexterity, constitution, that sort of thing. A really great example of this that is also built into the core mechanics is a game called Memento Mori. And it's a very dismal game. You are playing a character that is going to die. Uh, you are gifted with some sort of vision, and then there's a corruption that takes hold. And you, the attributes are things like uh, cerebrum, uh, viscera, uh, limbs. I think is is one, and then your your blood, and then there's a, there's another one. There's like four main stats total, and then blood is one that's always factored in. And based on uh, the the things around your character sheet, which even like your name can factor into it, even your your virtues and uh, whatever else can can factor it. Uh, into it when you're making a decision a check 
you will roll a certain amount of die and you count up successes uh, and you always roll your blood. The thing about the blood is there's always one pip that is corrupted and this is a, a black die that you roll and if you get a six on it, it's a dark success. The thing about a, a dark success is that you also fill in another pip on your, your blood die and eventually when you fill up your, your blood, there's only three pips you take that corruption and you stick it on one of your other attributes. And anytime you use that attribute, it's another black die. So this builds up very quickly in that you're choosing which attributes to use based on the situation. And when you do that, uh, you you descend further and further into this corruption. And it physically manifests on your character sheet. It's, uh, it's just a really smart, very thematic way for the game to tell you this, these are the things that we care about. This is how your character sheet is going to change over time, which is something that I, I think is is great when it can happen because a lot of character sheets are just stagnant unless you're adding, uh, unless you hit another level or unless you, you're adding gear to it. Basically, nothing else happens. It's just a sheet of paper that you reference. So the the actual act of playing the game is through a lot of these these attributes, which feels way stronger well, I think it also speaks to genre. So if you had to talk about Memento Mori's genre, because I don't know anything about it, um, how would you describe it? So, for example, I would say D&D is like a monster fighting game. Like that's what really the rules are about is fighting monsters and people and stuff. Um, whereas something like I haven't played it, but Call of Cthulhu feels more like a social interaction game where combat is like very quick and bloody and not really the point as much as it is exploring your character's psyche and how they change over the course of the story. So like what what is Memento Mori's genre within the TTRPG space? I, I feel like, and I could be wrong, I watched um, David Thomavore's Thomavore, uh, his review on it, which I'll, I'll put in the show notes. It's it's. it's a really thorough explanation um, of of the game, but it feels more like Call of Cthulhu esque, where you are doing less. Uh, like I don't think there's any tactical combat in it. It's more about you have something that you want to do with your your character, like some sort of virtue that you're chasing or, or some dream rather that your character is motivated by, and you're going through the world uh, trying to complete this task basically before you die, before you turn into a monster. So you have to have buy in like right from the start but at the same time i don't think that this idea of integrating your attributes into into the actual game mechanics nothing about the the game would would change if you if it were more focused on tactical combat because you could still do the same thing it's like okay if my character is is cunning i'm going to use my dagger and my cunning and you know roll that as damage instead of whatever so i i don't think that uh that what we have now in, in Dungeons and Dragons is necessarily what it would need to be in order to to maintain like the status quo. I think there's plenty of different ways that you can make use of attributes that are more uh, thematic, but at the same time, in, in Dungeons and Dragons, we're, we're really aiming for mediocrity and, and mass acceptance and ease of understanding. So, so maybe this is maybe this is the best iteration uh, of it. Yeah, I was about to mention uh the word i would use is, is accessibility like, like how mediocrity. accessible it is well um there yeah because it is amazing at being accessible like right. i i think For mediocrity sure. it depends on kind of your definition i think that there's a lot of ways it's mediocre like don't <laughs> mistake me for defending D D all the way but i will defend um like ability score modifiers and proficiency bonus in D&D because this is the way I look at it. Um, I don't think D&D does this the best. This is why I'm making my own system. But um, I think what like ability score modifiers could represent is just, and this is not how it's described in D&D, by the way, um, is just your character's general conditioning um, and their general attributes, whereas their proficiency is like, demonstrating some sort of specific area of expertise so for example i don't mind strength dex constitution um as my three physical attributes um because having taught martial arts for years 
I've definitely met people that are highly dexterous, not very strong, not a lot of constitution, but you know, they can wiggle out of a, out of a lock, you know, like a little snake or something. I've also met people that are not only really dexterous, but also really strong. They can lift heavy, um, but they haven't sacrificed their mobility because of it. Um, and I've met people that are neither, but they have really high constitution. They can, you know, uh, sit down and paint an entire room in a whole day without any breaks or something like, so I do think that those attributes kind of make sense, but the two scores that I really dislike in D and D are intelligence and wisdom. Um, I think, uh, what are they? How do you mean? How, how do you define intelligence and wisdom? Do you mean personally or how it's it represented in D and D? Cause uh, let's say this how is where it's represented I get. in D and D. Okay. So, in D and D, um, intelligence is represented by your knowledge, just how many facts you know, and wisdom is your general sensitivity and awareness. So um, this is where, like, I think that medicine should be an intelligence skill in D and D, because you can't just be like, "Oh, I feel like the problem is this." you're better. <laughs> Your wounds are healed. Like that's not how medicine works. You you have to go to school to get good at it and you have to like know things. But uh, the counter argument I've heard from people is, well, wisdom is applied knowledge. And it's like, that's fine, but that's not how it's used within the game's math of D&D. So I think that those terms are just a little too vague for the function that they seem to serve in the system. Mm. Uh, the way that I so I, I still use intelligence, I still use wisdom, but how I phrase wisdom is that it's cultivated perspective based on your experiences, whereas intelligence is the is like the uh, accumulated knowledge. Uh, man, uh, I, I really want to find the actual definition because I paid very close attention to how it was written out in the in the beta. But uh, but essentially the the point is that. You can have a bunch of of knowledge, like you can be well read, you can be uh, inventive and logical and uh, quick to learn, but uh, that doesn't really mean anything if you grew up isolated. Like you know a very specific set of things. If you are well traveled, you will have learned more, even if you're not, you know, logical or or well read and and that sort of thing by virtue of the people that you've interacted with. So that uh, cultivated perspective, I think, is is what maybe D and D should try to like point to more. The other difference is in distal knowledge and skills are separated from the yeah. attributes. So you're not like in in my system. I'm still doing the D and D thing where like what I call the knowledge attribute is still attached to things like Arcana, history, religion those skill proficiencies. Um, I just changed the names because I think the function is fine. I think that you can be really smart, but completely oblivious. I also think that you can be really aware and sensitive to the things around you, but not have a lot of knowledge about those things. And I think you can be both where, <laughs> you know, you are well read and also worldly and have all this, um, you know, accumulated wisdom. So the note I made in my like core rules document is just intelligence and wisdom, those vague concepts, whatever they mean for you as the character or as the player role playing the character, that's up to you to convey and define the however you want. I just feel like especially intelligence can be like a loaded term for a lot of people. And rather than get stuck trying to get someone on board with my definition, um, I just want to remove the confusion from the game for for influencing people, deceiving people, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and in my game, and like there is no charisma, we just use influence. So it's as a skill. And how you decide to influence is totally up to you. And if you want to intimidate somebody, if you want to deceive them, if you want to coerce them, uh, I think it's the I put the onus on the GM to figure out the the difficulty of the DC by virtue of what the player wants to do with their influence. So that way it, it kind of, it contorts that, that concept a little bit. And I think feels a little bit more natural than funneling it through the, uh, the ability scores. I mean, there's, there's no one correct way to do that. And I think that you, 
throughout our conversation that should be abundantly clear. Uh, it's it's more like what do you want to achieve with the goals of your of your game. The other thing um, I'm really is another reason why I kept the charisma skills in. It, it actually came up in a recent conversation I had with one of my players, which is in 2014, um, like rules. It says very plainly that it's it's an alternate rule, but uh, that you can just switch uh, ability scores and proficiency bonuses depending on the situation. So, for example, if someone is so fast with their knife, like uh, I think in, in the second Alien movie um, where the robot is like doing the, the using the knife to poke between the person's fingers no, and he's just going faster and faster and the guy is getting more and more freaked out. That would be like a dexterity intimidation check. So these are like the three main ways that you can move towards someone or influence someone, you know, scaring them, charming them, you know, deceiving them. Even though they're commonly used with charisma, they're not stuck with charisma. But again, the game I'm to go back to it. I'm okay with my abstract game objects being abstract game objects that facilitate a story and aren't necessarily interwoven with the story. Okay, so I got a question for you. And I've been thinking about this a lot too. The idea of a dump stat, I think you have one solution for it. I, maybe not a solution, but one incentive to not, um, not go that direction. Uh, what would a game without a dump stat, but still having attributes, ability scores, uh, what would that look like? Can you, can you like get a little more specific for me? Like- what sort, I mean, can, I'm, ver- I'm very much putting you on the spot. Um, what sort of mechanics would be implemented in order to avoid the entire concept of having a dump stat? It's a good question. Um, cause even so, if you don't put bonus in something, you, that is essentially the dump stat, right? Right, um, right. Well, again, I think it comes to how much the stories you want to tell in your game value the individual versus the group. So for example, when I look at Dungeons and Dragons, it is very clear that the game is intended to be played as a group with different character classes and different specializations. So the reason that a dump stat exists is because um, somebody else will cover the gap that your character has. Theoretically, this is also why I've tried playing games where everyone has the same class and they end up terrible Um, because you some challenges are overwhelming and some challenges are underwhelming and you never hit a sweet spot. The thing I don't like about Dungeons and Dragons is pretty much you can predict who's going to have what dump stat. So, for example, the big, dumb, strong guy will always be big and dumb. I I played with that a little in one game where instead of being big and dumb, he was actually big and smart, but not very charismatic. So it's just that the, the flaw is just a little too predictable for my tastes. Whereas I think that you could design the game in a way where the flaw is a little less predictable. And so you get more story possibilities out of it. Um, But to have a game without dump stats, I really think it has to do with genre So, for example, um, my family and I play uh, this game that I, it's a Frankenstein game, to play Mobile Suit Gundam, the TTRPG. And because I have hundreds of little 144 scale Gunpla models that I like playing on my Chessex grid. And I'm going to put you solo. Okay. Oh, look (laughs) at all the Gunpla that over here is a destroy Gundam that I bought for myself. That was a hundred something dollars. Um, and yes, that was Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? Seasons 1 and 2 <laughs> on DVD. But the idea of that game is that pretty much all of the player characters are high school students. They're not supernatural in any way. They don't have particular gifts. Yeah, there are some skill modifiers, but they're, it's not like ability score modifier plus skill bonus. It's just some random skills I think they may have picked up from school that may offer some flavor, but there's not really a mechanical weight to it. It's more just, again, th- it, the, the numbers are there for these players to help them get in the mindset of their character more than anything. And so because they have a flat playing field to start with, 
really the heavy lifting of the mechanics is whatever robot they chose, which I designed for them. And that way the game is less about how do I create my character's build to optimize some sort of mechanical function. And it's more about discovering what new tricks my robot has that I'm learning along the way. So yes, some robots have some strengths and flaws or whatever built into them, but the fun of the game is figuring out, oh, I didn't realize I had a plasma cannon that blows up two enemy units automatically, or I didn't know I had a beam saber that does more damage than my rifle. So they're kind of like learning how their robot works throughout the course of the adventure. It is interesting because the the less fiddly numbers that you have, the more focus the game is on a role play um, discovery. And I think to some degree, we're rolling with the punches. So instead of this is our sandbox, we can do whatever we want with it. It's like, no, we're actually playing a game and we have to talk to each other and you know, progress the story. I, I This is just a loose thought, but uh, how much how much do you want them to track versus how much do you want them to uh, uh, interact, maybe? I don't know. Maybe that's a, a weird way to put that. Yeah, no, I, I think you're on the right track. Another, I don't think this is exact either, but, um, you know, uh, our friend Ian sent us an extra credits video last night in our group chat. Um, and one of the things that they were talking about was just, if you want to make them think, you have to have clear rules. And if you want to make them feel, you have to kind of hide the rules. Um, and I think that there's a similar lineup here where if you have less rules, it's easier to feel because there's less things cluttering in the way to think about. If you want it to be more of a puzzle that you're solving, something more cognitive, um, then you have more rules, which is why I think Pathfinder 2nd Edition appeals so fervently to uh, to a, a good number of people because they love the puzzle. They they There's an emotional response to the thinking. Um, for other people, there's a frustration to the amount to have to keep track of. The majority of my experience with Pathfinder comes through the Glass Cannon podcast, which is a like something that i've been listening to for years at this point like what more than four years or something and is it first edition or second edition so it was first edition they moved to second edition within the last however long when i at least in in first edition saw them playing it seemed that there were, were characters that were very very good at very specific things uh like they have just crazy damage output or or something like that and you had to build pretty specifically to to get that so there it seemed like there was a lot of min maxing more so than breadth of of uh, content and at the same time the the adventures would they they ran through um giant slayer uh the adventure path and this took them like what three years or something and uh and i think it's like five books long like it's it's legit you know, start to finish uh nothing to, to heroes uh there toward the end and you know, they, they, they milled through a lot of characters just by virtue of dying and that sort of thing. But as they became more powerful, their strengths were, I guess, on par with the things that they were fighting. And that, that makes sense. But a part of me always wonders about a progressing a character in, in that vein when you're at the same time diminishing the value of the progression that the characters uh, gain. And I, I don't think that it's a bad thing. Um, I know it's something that um, Destiny 2, just as a video game, struggled with a lot because they they scale all of their like uh, environments and that sort of thing. Uh, so as you become stronger in power level, the things that you're fighting, like basically you feel like you're doing the same thing the entire game at the same time that you're just like trying to get more and more powerful. It's, it's really weird. Um, weird on its head. It's fun when you're playing kind of sort of. So I, I wonder if mechanically wonder what the real value is of increasing these numbers when when ultimately you're going to be fighting level appropriate mobs that do a level appropriate damage and you're basically going to just continue playing the same game is it an illusion of progression which is fine again a lot of people like that we need the carrot on the stick to keep us playing but at the same time part of it does feel a little bit maybe disingenuous is too strong of a word, but it's very gamey at the least. I've had this conversation a few times with a few of my friends and I, I think that's a possible route, but I don't think it's the only one. 
which is just uh actually the one i think about is pokemon um and and pokemon red and blue because i'm a gen oneer uh so when you first play pokemon and you first get your little monster um the only thing they can do is like tackle and growl those are like the only two options and really tackle because <laughs> you're not going to sit there and growl at the other person so when you first start playing the like the original games the only pokemon you can fight in the wild are like rattatas and pidgeys it's a very simple mind numbing game of just hit the other person harder than they can hit you but as you start to progress toward you know the first and second gyms you start learning about types and that adds a complication so it becomes more about um you know making sure i'm i'm matching up the rock paper scissors effectively and you can pr pretty much get through the entire campaign like that but as soon as you start playing multiplayer it becomes a whole lot different where now you have to factor in you know adding in conditions and which conditions are going to make the most sense factor in critical hit rates um if we're talking about gen 1 you know lining up your special attackers and your your speed values um and then you know you get to the later games and you start factoring in abilities so the game yes your character gets more powerful but the the interaction gets more interesting cuz it gets more complex and there are different dimensions that you're adding on to. So, you know, I think Baldur's Gate 3 did a great job of showing how D&D 5e in particular can start relatively simple by going up and just hitting the imps. Um, but, you know, that final boss battle had a lot of layers to it. Um, and it wasn't just a straightforward damage slog. Um, so I think that as designers, as we're thinking about characters getting to higher levels, just the monsters as well are not the best tool for creating engaging combat. It's thinking of things like the environment, changing the wind condition, changing the uh, the circumstances. So, you know, what's the weather like? You know, if the battlefield is raining, how is that going to be different than if it's sunny? Like all these different ways that we can complicate it are ways to engage our players and make it more interesting beyond just we're fighting the level 80 crowd instead of the level two crowd i feel like we're we've slightly gotten off the the topic of attribute scores but if you had to change something about the way that D, &D specifically handles their uh ability scores what would you do make each ability score mean more um and don't tie class abilities to specific ability scores like give that them a is choice. very popular uh nowadays i feel like uh and a lot of games are trying to solve for that particular problem so dc20 just as an example has like a like a prime modifier which is i don't know it's like the participation trophy of 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 ability scores it, you you always get your proficiency modifier it's essentially a proficiency modifier but it's based on your attributes but at the same time you have to have like you, you need to make sure that your uh your highest attribute is one that you're using for combat I don't, it makes more sense when i'm when you're looking at it but but the problem that it's trying to solve is is that you want to be able to to be as effective as you you should be without compromising on the stats that you're you're putting points into and and i feel like that idea of everybody can be anything that they want and there's no bad way to build and everything's fine is a very i certainly not for like i i don't know that i want that for distal because the game is is all about like hardship and earning your triumphs instead of them just being handed to you and i think when you create the expectation that everybody's on the same playing field you're doing yourself a disservice in creating less interesting characters and i think that we disagree on some of this stuff but yeah I, yeah okay I'm, well yeah <laughs> so i think it, it depends on what your ability scores represent so for example in swift guard if you're a spellcaster that has charisma um your charisma adds to your damage and healing mm -hmm. like that's the thing it adds because the idea is you have greater willpower so you have a more powerful battery to blow up things if you have a higher knowledge you know more spells so essentially it's the difference between a warlock and a wizard 
it's just not saying that if you want the damage one, these are the spells you're locked into. And if you want to be knowledge based, these are the spells you're locked into. So you could be a knowledge based cleric. You're not going to heal as well, but you have more healing spells so that you've got more options for when things get injured, right? Or your allies get injured or diseased or whatever. So, but maybe your the story you want to tell is that you're a cleric, but you're just really charismatic and you're the person people go to for advice. You're the person that can um, be diplomatic when they need to. And your healing is really good. You just don't have the same level of knowledge as someone else. So I don't think that it's an even playing field. I just think that the strengths and weaknesses are at different axes, whereas the class features can be their own axis. Yeah, I don't I don't think it's necessarily making it more bland. To me, it's making it more flavorful. Earlier, we were talking about uh, what a game could look like if you didn't have a dump stat. And one of the ideas that I was kicking around, I don't know if it's right for, for Distal in particular, but your your negative attributes, what if that served you in some way? For example, you could have certain spells in the game that only make use of negative attributes. Maybe it's like something that capitalizes on, like it's, it's some sort of curse and you're like investing that from yourself onto the, the target. It could be that um, maybe in, in uh, through your normal character progression, you were once very uh, like isolated. So your, your intelligence is not that high just because you haven't like done a whole whole lot or you know, maybe a wisdom or something like that. But maybe that uh, maybe one day you become a vampire and that lack of that negative intelligence actually serves you in some other way. Whereas, you know, because you're kind of like instinctually away from from people, uh, you you gain some sort of benefit or maybe a different uh, different perspective. Maybe um, if you were a so in my game, there's uh, a, a lineage called a, a wild walker. And these these folks are very much um, used to be servants of woodland gods. They're like partly animal and they have elven runes inscribed on their 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 body. And they're they're just like very animal sort of woodland spirits almost. And they have a negative uh, intelligence score to start. And the way that I rationalize that is that they haven't really experienced a whole lot um, in the world. And they also have some deficiencies when it comes to like, they have like a more basal brain. So that um, the sort of like maybe snake mind or fight, fight or flight, really just instinctive sort of mentality that prevents them not necessarily from higher thinking, but it's, it's something that holds them back, something that they default to when there's like a level of stress. But if you were a werewolf, for example, maybe that connection to your more primal instincts is actually a benefit for you. So there could be ways that your dump stat is only only so under certain circumstances. So my immediate response is I love it. Um, I think that it's a really interesting dimension that's underexplored in games. In terms of understanding it, I think that... Um, I, and again, I'm thinking from the accessibility angle of getting new players in the game. I think it could be confusing. Like, I, I would have that be part of a supplement of a core system as opposed to part of a core system unless playtesters show me I'm wrong. Um, but like just to talk to the legitimacy of the logic, um, recently uh, one of my friends from high school was up and his wife and I were talking and his wife turns out is a, a prison guard at a woman's prison. And one of the... to. She didn't say it like this, but I'm going to say it like this. Basically, some of the inmates are too dumb to feel pain. Um, so what she was saying is you'd get a new security guard and you'd have to take someone hostile out of their cell to bring them somewhere else. And the the problem is a lot of these security guards would uh, like default to uh, ballistic compliance, like basically hit them. And the problem with that is if you hit them, they won't act the way that someone would hit. We would get hit. You know, if somebody punches me in the mouth, it would be different than if somebody um, the, these kind of these people are getting punched in the mouth. So and the other downside to it is that you could injure them and they wouldn't know. So like you could crack a rib and then you as the guard get in trouble, even if you were defending yourself. Um, and this person. could So 
she was describing how like joint locks and stuff are, are much more uh, reliable because you know, they can't move. So whether or not there's pain involved, like it's, it doesn't matter. You've, you've immobilized them somehow. So, but it, it's exactly what you're saying, which is in, in this case, like a negative to awareness or whatever would actually result in less damage getting taken um, or put off the damage as like temporary hit points or something like that. So I could definitely see some interesting stories coming about um, with that line of thinking. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting thought. So right now, um, as you accumulate death marks in the game, so your experience with death, your your maximum HP goes up by one. But now I'm, I'm thinking like, hmm, I, I wonder if, if you could do that with the negative stats. Like, that would be... Seems interesting. Okay, well, do you have any, any more on ability scores? All right, our conversation was all over the place, but hopefully, hopefully, you uh, found this video interesting, helpful, or entertaining. And if you did, please feel free to like, subscribe, tell your friends about the channel, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks very much, folks. You're all signing off.